In the early morning hours of March 14, 2007, Ryan Skipper's lifeless body was discovered on a gravel road in Winter Haven, Florida. The 25-year-old student had been stabbed a total of 19 times. Within days, authorities arrested Joseph Bearden and William Brown Jr. for Skipper's murder. The two men were both known to be heavy methamphetamine users. Because Skipper was openly gay, his family and friends believe the murder was a hate crime. But the defense argues that this was actually a robbery gone bad and that Skipper was killed for his brand new car. They say that Bearden wasn't present when the stabbing took place. Joseph Bearden and William Brown Jr. have been charged with first-degree murder. Both men face the possibility of the death penalty. But as you know, if you've been watching, Joseph Bearden's appearance changed dramatically since he was arrested in March of 2007. He's donned some facial tattoos, courtesy apparently of the Florida State Penal System. Now, we've seen some other prison inmates who have had some facial tattoos. On the first day of his trial, Charles Manson showed up with an X carved on his forehead, stating that he, in his words, had X'd himself from your world. And a jailhouse snitch who took the stand in the Perry March trial had a visible tattoo above his neckline. Russell Farris testified that March had asked him to kill his in-laws, somehow thinking that that would help him beat the murder rap. The noticeable tattoo that Farris had was the question mark on his neck. Joining us now in the studio is another good friend of the networks here, forensic psychologist, Dr. Buzz von Ornsteiner, to talk about all this. So, Dr. Buzz, when you look at this with tattoos, I guess my question is a general and a broader one. What is, what's the, psychologically, the notion behind, especially guys who are incarcerated, wearing tattoos? Why is it that there seems to be such an attraction to them? One is, many people take on the norms of that society and they don't believe necessarily that they're coming out or their face becomes a projection of how they want the world to see them. It becomes their history of what they're experiencing and being incarcerated is part of their life's history. With, with the defendant's tattoo, it becomes very assaultive. It's definitely saying, I am carrying my armor, or one can interpret it that way, that you can't go around prison carrying knives and weapons, but you definitely have daggers in your eyes. And if you're looking at me, you need to stay away from me because I can damage you. It becomes how the person wants people to view them not only in prison but they have to take accountability of when they are finally released and how the world will see them also. Yeah. I, Dr. Rose, I want to ask you another question but while I, I do that I want to throw up some pictures of some other illustrations that we've talked about the the notion of teardrops um, on people's eyes and, and we can show you a couple of, of shots of that then and you know my understanding is, is, is teardrops originally uh, in, if you look at a history of teardrop tattoos talk about the fact that originally it had to do with expressing grief or sorrow uh, having lost a loved one, uh, we're told now they can also, within the, the prison system, mean that you were there because you took a life or because you were incarcerated. Uh, there's some other instances in addition to the teardrops, such as this, um, and then some other meaningful, such as this, that, that may mean something to an individual. Uh, that being said, Dr. Buzz, let me come back to this case. This defendant is not a very big guy. Uh, and, and you look yes. at him walking into the courtroom and you're thinking, you know what, I'm not so sure this guy's going to be able to handle himself in any physical situation. What's the significance then, do you think, given him and his own background and his demeanor and his stature here to the idea of, of tattoos? Well, one is he may not have good communication skills in, inside prison or without prison, but he also has a concept of, of masculinity and being tough, and those fears then create those anxieties that he needs something to show the population within prison, which my understanding he was brutally beaten up. We have his foster care uh, mother for that kind of information. It may be true, it may not, but he needs some kind of armor. He needs some kind of protection. He needs some kind of way to communicate to that population that I am a very tough guy, that I have armor, that I am threatening, and as I stated, that I have daggers coming out of my eyes. And if you want to bother me, if you want to try anything with me, I'm going to be able to fight back at least visually. It's one way of being tough. Another 
solution to that is to work out in a gym. Another yeah. solution to that is to buddy up with someone else who's very uh, muscular, who yeah. looks very threatening. You do have choices. Another solution to that is to go into uh, confinement and be isolated away from people who right. may be threatening you. Another solution to that is to see a psychologist, a social worker, to seek psychiatric help. Those are viewed as weaknesses yeah. within the prison system, but those are choices people can make when they come into the prison system. I was in prison, but as a psychologist, and right. believe me, not everybody uses tattoos as a way of informing people non-verbally that they are very tough and need to scare and assault people. Yeah. Dr. J. Buzz Von Orensteiner, howdy my friend, who's also Thank brilliant you. when it comes to all of our brains and why anybody, anybody, would show up in court looking like Joey Bearden has shown up in court, as well as all the other aspects to this case, and there are far too many to name right now. But look, I don't know if we're ever going to see that weapon in this uh, case or not, but let me just ask you, brain doctor, if I can call you that. Okay, hey, whatever you want to call me. <laughs> okay, well, from a brain doctor perspective, <laughs> if a jury doesn't have a murder weapon, does it matter? If you don't actually know what, what physically caused this and there's no evidence of it, does that matter to them and them piecing it all together as a puzzle? Not necessarily. It depends on how much the jury actually has. Now, we're seeing a lot of information that the jury is not going to see. So it becomes somewhat confusing. We have the grandma in Tennessee. We have the knife in the tree. We also have a witness who says that she knows someone who said that the defendant did not kill uh, the victim. So we're hearing a lot of information that the jury doesn't have. The jury needs to have the tools. And unfortunately, we also hope that the jury is not led emotionally by seeing the defendant's face. We hope that they can stay clear and judge this accurately and fairly without letting their emotions rule them by seeing good all these point. daggers over the eye. Okay, good point. What if their emotions are led, however, by just seeing the presence of a mere knife or a weapon? That's true. Emotions, unfortunately, do skew our perception. And unfortunately, that is a fragile part of our emotional brain. We are ruled by what we see. We are very easily swayed, oftentimes by how good looking a defendant is, or how educated a defendant is, or how well they're dressed, or how they act within how the courtroom proceeds. Oh, I am so glad you said that because I remember okay. uh, a decade and a half ago reading this giant editorial from a really well-respected journalist in Canada about how handsome O.J. Simpson looked during his murder trial sitting there at defense table. And a lot of people were outraged that that was what the editorial was about, how handsome he looked as opposed to what the evidence was in the case. Time for us to wrap it up for the day, but not before we thank good friend Dr. J. Buzz, Von Orensteiner. Thanks. Thanks. We appreciate it.